Hello my lovelies and welcome to the Spirit Tarot and Healing Arts YouTube channel. If you are new, welcome back. If you are a returning viewer, I'm Rin and today we're going to talk about my tips for giving more accurate tarot reading. For those who don't know me already, I am a tarot expert who has been reading tarot since 1995. And for those of you who think that I don't look old enough to have started reading in 1995 at a respectable age, uh, I love you, thank you, but I was 16 in 1995, and hopefully none of you are ambitious enough to do the math on how old that makes me today. But I am, in fact, a proud member of Gen X. But this video isn't about me, so if you're interested in all of the things that I'm trained in and I do, you can check out my about section on my website, but we're here to talk tips for giving more accurate tarot readings. Those of you who have followed me for a while, I have a feeling that this one's gonna get pretty lengthy. I'm gonna try not to. I'm gonna try to make this a reasonable amount of time. But you all know, once I get talking about tarot, sometimes I just can't shut my gob. So, fair warning, I've got like 22 or 23 tips here for giving more accurate tarot readings. I suggest grabbing a beverage of your choice and uh, maybe a snack and a blankie too. Now, I saw a video a little while back that inspired this one because you guys know I'm you know watching what's going on in the tarot community and that and I found an old video uh, by someone who had only been reading for a couple of years by the time they did the video and I don't even remember who it was uh, unfortunately and it wasn't like there was nothing wrong with her video but I was like hmm I don't know how many of those would be my tips for giving more accurate readings. I didn't completely disagree with her. Um, the stuff that she, she suggested, ooh, that was a tongue twister for me, um, were actually, I mean, good things for, for helping, especially beginning tarot readers. So there was nothing wrong. I was just like, you know, I don't know that that would be my list of tips for giving more accurate readings. And again, no shade to her. Um, it's just, it got me thinking about what I would say to someone and I really wish that I would have like, I cleared my history and everything the other day cause I was trying to like streamline things and I accidentally cleared that video for my history as well. So I can't like find the video again to link her cause it was buried down there in tarot too. But again, it wasn't that I disagreed with her. It just wasn't necessarily the tips I would give. So that got me curious and I started looking around for what other people gave as tips for giving more accurate tarot readings. And I found a lot of fluff and a lot of crap. If I'm being completely honest, there was a lot of people using a lot of words on the page, but not really saying a whole lot. But then I also found some real gems, some readers that were just giving tips that I thought were amazing. But there were a lot of common themes uh, among them, or at least in, you know, like idea in bullet point. Uh, there were a lot of common themes and they aligned with a lot of the things that I would recommend. So that all inspired me to come up with my own list for this. Now, I kind of almost hate to call it tips for giving more accurate tarot readings for myself. When you throw in the word accurate, um, that to me personally, and I don't know if you're the same or not, but when I hear accurate in regard to tarot readings, that to me, sorry, my neighbor's dog was going a little bit crazy there for a second, but when you use the word accurate or accuracy in regard to tarot readings, to me personally, that conjures up the thought of how often they are right in their predictive readings. And while I have nothing against predictive readings for the most part, I have sort of some rules that I go by for myself personally as a reader. Um, I, I really don't have an issue overall with predictive readings. I read tarot, yes, but I also read a few other systems and 
honestly, some of the other systems that I read, the whole purpose of them was fortune telling. The whole purpose was prediction. And so, you know, I embrace those systems. I think all the different systems have their time and their place. And so when I hear the word accurate, it's like, well, how often do you get it right? And a lot of the types of readings that I do, how do you, how do you measure the accuracy? I mean, when I talk about things that are going on in the present that come up in a reading in a client's life, they can be like, oh yeah, that is happening right now. And you know, that is accuracy. But when you think about accuracy in terms of how many times you get the prediction, right? If you're doing predictive readings, oh man, I've talked a lot and I'm going to try to leave it out. See, I told you guys I was going to get wordy in this. Um, those of you who have followed me know that I tell clients and other readers all the time, our fates are not fixed. They are not written in stone. We have the power to change them. And sometimes we change the outcome when we didn't mean to because we deviate from our path um, without thinking that that's going to cause, you know, a ripple effect of change. And sometimes, you know, they are spot on because we choose to follow that. And sometimes we want to change the outcomes, but all right, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I promise. The point is, is that I really am not sure how I feel about the word accuracy. I feel like it gets thrown around a lot in ways that I personally don't like. Sometimes you will see psychics and tarot readers, etc., advertise themselves as whatever percent accurate. And even if you're trying to do that scientifically and keep good records, there's still a lot of subjectivity to that. And I always tell clients, whether it's someone you're wanting to learn from or someone you're wanting to get a reading from, stay away from anyone who says they are 100% accurate. Uh, I'd even shy away from people that are like 98, 99% accurate. If you are touting your services in that way, it says a little something about you, but also we are human beings at the end of the day and none of us can get it right all of the time. So 100% accurate, mm -mm, I call bullshit. I uno reverso. No, we're not falling for that because you are a human being at the end of the day and you cannot, it's statistically impossible for you to get it right. A hundred percent of the time, even 98, 99%. I feel like you're straining credulity when you make those claims and how exactly are you arriving at those percentages? Because I have that background in behavioral statistics. I want to see the raw data and I want to know how you calculated it. So maybe we should call this uh, how to give the highest tips for giving the highest quality readings rather than the most accurate, but I got to go with the words people are going to type in the search bar. But for myself personally as a reader, and I you know can't say that this is right for everyone, but I personally strive to give the highest quality readings and then by doing that, I believe the accuracy will fall where it needs to be by seeking to deliver the highest quality of reading rather than hyper fixating on accuracy, which I think is a subjective word in the tarot community as it is. All right. So without any further fuss and muss, let's get into my personal tips. Now these come from my personal experience. Um, there are things that like I had a list. I told you I kind of searched the web, saw what were the, the themes that a lot of tarot readers were hitting. And then I refined my list into these various points. But again, this is all subjective and these are my tips. So uh, you can take them or leave them and you can certainly add to them if you have other tips for giving the most accurate reading. So the first tip that I have, and I did try to put these almost in sort of a, an order, but they don't have to be because you kind of do several of them at once, but then, you know, there are things that you can build up to. But the first thing, the first tip I have for giving the most accurate tarot readings is for you to understand how you personally view and work with the tarot, because not all readers view and work with the tarot the same way. 
Now, even if you are just starting out and you've never read before, I encourage you to research tarot and write down sort of your hypothesis or your working theory as to how tarot works and how you work with the tarot and how you view the tarot because that outlines your expectations of the tarot, uh, where you stand now, what you know, and everything. And if you truly break down how you understand, view, and work with the tarot, then that helps you as a reader define your path, carve out your path, and it influences how you read the cards as well. So, you know, for me personally, I always say that for me, tarot is like a compass. It shows us the direction, you know, where we are right now. It can show us where we've been and it shows us the direction that we're headed in. And if we decide we don't like that direction, we have the ability to change it. Or if we make a wrong turn or something, then it's going to change the outcome. But tarot shows us the direction we're headed in, just like a compass would. And then we have the power to alter course from there. When it comes to what I'm connecting with when I do tarot readings for myself personally, I'm connecting to my higher self, my spirit guides, my ancestors, uh, my gods, my, you know, concept of spirit overall. That is where I am connecting when I do a reading. Not all readers work in the same way. Not all readers tap into the same sources for their information and their guidance as they are reading the tarot. So it's important to know what you believe you are tapping into. Now, all of that said, that may change for you over time and that's okay. If you start out with tarot and you're like, oh, I'm just memorizing the meanings of the cards. I'm not connecting to anything or, oh, I'm connecting to spirit guides or what have you. It may change as you continue to explore your own personal tarot path and you experience, you know, your own different um, encounters on your journey. So don't be afraid to let your view of tarot and uh, how you work with tarot change, grow and expand over time because that is perfectly okay. So don't be worried that, oh, I didn't really think about how I view tarot, how I want to work with tarot, or how I believe I should work with tarot. You know, write that down now with the understanding that it's okay if that changes later on. Just because you are declaring that, if you will, now, it's not something that then you're locked into for life. You have the ability to change those views as you go if that's what's right for you. The next tip is, you know, and some people will see this as common sense. Um, but the next tip I have is to find a deck that you really click with. Now, for those who think this is common sense, uh, sometimes it's not always so cut and dry. Uh, those of you who know my story, my background, when I was 16, my parents gave me the Rider Waite Smith deck. And I started reading with that and I really struggled as a reader. I never thought that I'd be a professional reader. I never thought I'd be really good at doing readings because I did not click with that deck, but I thought I had to, I thought I had to get that deck in order to do readings. Now, granted, this was 1995. There weren't a lot of tarot decks around at the time, uh, at least not where I lived, um, and that, but I was like, oh man, this is, this is the best I'm ever going to get because this just is what it is. And then in 2000, I got the Russian tarot of St. Petersburg. And you guys know how I have talked about that deck just instantly clicked with me. It's a Rider Waite Smith clone, but whatever was holding me back because of not clicking, whatever was making me, preventing me from clicking with the Rider Waite Smith deck, this Russian tarot, the Russian Tarot of St. Petersburg didn't have that. And so I was able to instantly click with that deck and my readings just went to a whole nother level. It wasn't like I suddenly knew so much more about reading tarot. It was that I clicked with that deck and then I was able to excel as a reader. And so it's not uncommon 
Um, especially in this economy and the price of decks for somebody to have a deck and they're like, I got to make this work, but they're not clicking with the deck and it's holding back their readings. It really does make so much more of a difference. You can have all of the traditional meanings memorized. You can have great spreads memorized, but if you don't click with that deck, you might be able to give good readings with it. I mean, I could give good readings with the Rider Waite Smith back in those early years, but I didn't feel like I was excelling at it. I didn't feel like I was reaching my potential when I was correct because then once I had the Russian Tarot of St. Petersburg, suddenly I excelled at doing readings. My readings went from, mm, you know, meh, to, or at least that's how I viewed them, you know, but I'm very critical of myself and my work. But I could tell that there was a huge impact, a huge positive impact by having a deck that I clicked with. So, you know, if you have a deck and you're like, eh, I'm only a so-so reader or I'll never get this, it might be a case of you just need the right deck. And I do recommend, because especially because decks are expensive, uh, looking up like YouTube walkthroughs and flip-throughs of decks that you're considering to see if it really does suit your vibe and see if you really do feel like you can click with that deck because it is very important. But at the same time, we can't just all go out and buy a, you know, boatload of decks to see which ones we do and don't click with. But after my experience of having that click, that, uh-huh, that, oh my gosh, my readings are so much better now and using that deck for so long, then I could use so many more decks. And there are still decks I'll get that I don't click with and I just won't use. Um, that does still happen on occasion, but by and large, like I can read really well with a Rider Waite Smith deck now. It's interesting because I felt like I struggled. I felt like there was a glass ceiling when I started there, but now that I've read other decks, when I go back to the Rider Waite Smith, I can read it so much better now. But having a deck that you really click with, that you really vibe with is extremely important. The next thing I want to talk about for you know, being able to give higher quality readings, more accurate readings is to cleanse your deck. Now, different readers have different philosophies on how to cleanse decks and when to cleanse decks. So do what works for you, whatever seems right to you. So what I do is from time to time, I do a thorough cleansing ritual on my decks, but just on the regular, um, I will knock on them to cleanse them, shuffle them to cleanse them. Some people um, re-put their deck in order in order to cleanse it. There's a lot of different ways you can cleanse a deck. Different readers have different thoughts on how frequently and when you should cleanse your deck. I talked a little bit about this in the whole um, tarot gatekeeping video because of that, that TikTok that said you have to cleanse your dad, do a full cleansing after every reading. And we talked about how that isn't always practical and, and my thoughts on that whole subject, but it's something that I do feel you do need to do from time to time. Uh, but I don't think that it needs, yeah, you don't need a full cleansing ritual after every last single reading. That's just taking things too far. But you know, whenever you feel is appropriate for you to cleanse your deck. And if you feel like, oh, I've been doing really good readings, but now I feel like something's holding you back or the messages aren't as clear, then go ahead and cleanse your deck. Um, you know, if you feel any resistance or you feel like mm, there's just something's a little off, something's missing, try cleansing your deck. It'll probably help. And you'll probably, um, start to notice that you feel more connected in tune, like you're getting better readings out of your deck. The next tip is to practice, practice, practice. And that means having a daily tarot practice. Now what that looks like for you is going to depend on how you view the deck, how you work with the deck, how you connect with the deck. But you know, one of the tried and true ways is to simply have a daily draw where you just take, you know, you can ask a question or you can just leave it open to spirit or however you do things, but just to draw a card and then however you utilize that throughout the day, whether it's just sort of a study guide, whether you use it as guidance for the day, whatever works for you and your personal 
tarot practice, but you need to have some sort of daily practice and you know, drawing a card a day is all well and good, but to give more accurate readings, you need to be giving readings. So every day, whether it's a reading for yourself or whether it's for somebody else, you should be working with the cards every day. And even someone who's old hat like me, I try to work with the cards still every day, whether that's client readings, whether that's readings for myself, for my friends, whether it's trying different exercises, uh, learning new spread, whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be the same thing every day, but if you want to become a tarot expert, if you want to give the highest quality readings, then you need to immerse yourself in the tarot by having a connection and working with it in some way every day. And it doesn't have to be an all day, every day thing. You know, some days you could just draw a daily draw a single card and then as many times a week as you can you you know do some spreads and it doesn't have to be big long involved spreads i know tarot readers that you know all they ever do is three card spreads that's that's just how they work with the tarot so it can be as involved as you want if you want to you know spend an hour a day uh working with the tarot great. Um, but it could be a daily draw with, you know, a few short three card spreads throughout the week. It just depends on what fits into your schedule and what works with how you view tarot, but you should be doing something with a deck daily as often as possible. The next item for discussion is that the quality of your question can have an impact on the quality and accuracy of your reading. I talk about this a lot when we talk about yes, no questions, so I'm not going to rehash that again here. Uh, I think that a lot of different styles and types of questions have their time and their place, but when you are asking questions of the tarot, make sure that you are being clear that you're being concise without being overly concise because you do want to ask open-ended questions because you want whatever you're connecting to in my case spirit to be able to deliver you want to give them a little latitude so that they can deliver messages that maybe you don't anticipate because that's part of why we do readings, but you also want to be specific enough that they're answering about what you want and not what they want to tell you, because that's, you know, as I've talked about many times, especially with yes, no questions, that's the big thing. Um, there's no room with a yes, no question for spirit to yes, and you or no, and you. And sometimes we need what comes after the and in order to really get the context and understand things and to make the empowered decision. So you've got to make sure that your question is a good quality question. Now I probably am going to have to do a video on what makes a good quality question all on its own because it's different for different readers. It depends on what types of readings you're doing. It depends on how you connect, how you work with tarot, or if you're working with spirit or guides or whatever, that all plays into it, but really give some thought and consideration to what you are asking, how you are asking your question, the wording of your question. One of the things that I always avoid, like the plague, is using the word should in a question. I do not, like if I, if I happen to catch myself asking, should I, I always stop myself and reframe the question. And when clients ask a should I question, I always help them to reframe it because when we ask should I, we are giving our personal power over to the cards. And for me personally, that is not the purpose of a reading. The cards are not the boss of any of us. We are the bosses of our own lives. And when we ask, should I, we are giving our power, our personal power, we're handing it over to the cards and we want to retain our personal power. We want to remain the bosses of ourselves. And so that is why I avoid at all costs asking any question with the words, should I in it. But that's something that you can look into and study. You can see what different readers do, 
how they word their questions and figure out from that what works best for you in your readings. Next thing I have to say is to have a couple of really good go-to spreads in your repertoire. Now, this will look different for different readers. Use what works best for you. Um, you know, I've talked about at this point in my reading career, there's a lot of different readings that I have a method for reading rather than a outlined, clearly defined spread. But there are also spreads that I use for certain readings that I would never let go of. But have a way of approaching or answering yes, no questions, either by having a system for answering just a yes or a no with the tarot, or by having a way of reframing those questions into more open-ended questions that will give you more information, but have a couple of spreads or methods of reading that apply to, you know, the most common of tarot situations. And again, that will depend on what types of readings you do, which goes back to how you view and work with tarot, because some people, you know, a decision-making spread is something that they absolutely consider essential while others don't consider having a clearly defined decision-making spread essential. Some feel that the Celtic cross is a good spread for handling a wide variety of questions, most if not any questions. Um, again, you know, we all learn the Celtic cross, but I keep saying I don't see a lot of readers who regularly use it in their readings. So whatever types of questions you find yourself answering the most or you like to do the most, find a good, dependable spread that you know if you are asked a you know question along these lines, this spread will absolutely give me the answer and information I'm looking for. Again, that'll depend on how you view and work with tarot, what kinds of questions you like to answer or find yourself answering most, but make sure that you have some go-to spreads. Even if you are more of a method reader like I am, where I very often don't use a clearly defined spread, I still have go-to spreads for when I don't feel like my cascade method is the appropriate um, method of answering a specific question. Or I have spreads that I use for things like past life readings. I have grand tableau spreads, um, well, a spread that I use for the grand tableau for Lenormand that's specifically for manifestation and checking in on, you know, what exactly you're manifesting, what you're wanting to manifest, are you in alignment with that, how can you work to better manifest what it is. So I have spreads that are specifically for those kinds of things. I have a tarot spread specifically for manifestation so that in certain circumstances I have my go-to's that I can use and it really does help to deliver a quality reading. Let's talk about card meanings now. My next tip for delivering accurate or quality readings is that you should know the traditional meanings of the cards, at least most of them. Sometimes we can uh, bicker about what is or isn't a traditional meaning for a card, but have a basic understanding of the most commonly accepted meanings of the cards but also allow for the images and your intuition to guide you when you are interpreting cards in a reading. So have that base knowledge, but allow those other things to influence you as well. I know there are readers out there who read strictly by memorized meanings. I have known some that deliver excellent readings. That is just how they work with the tarot. But for most of us, we need to let those other influences in. Um, sometimes too, it's not just having our traditional meanings, but it's allowing specific decks to have their own meanings for some of the cards, or we may bring meanings from a specific deck into our overall, uh, understanding of a card. The eight of cups is like that for me. Um, I understood the traditional meanings 
for that card, but then I got the Lightseer Tarot and there was just a little nugget of information in there, a little way of phrasing the Eight of Cups. And I loved it so much that not only do I use that when I read the Lightseer's Tarot, but I have brought that meaning of the Eight of Cups into my readings as a whole. Going along with that, develop a good relationship with the court cards. I recommend, and again, there's not just one way to read the tarot. There is not a right or wrong way necessarily to read the tarot. Uh, but I do recommend getting a good relationship with the court cards. And that means being able to identify them as people, but also having meanings for them that are not associated with people. Because the court cards, you know, that's the, the segment of the tarot that a lot of us readers have to work the longest and hardest at to really master because, and I still, 30, almost 30 years of reading, and I feel like there is still so much I can learn about the court cards. But sometimes they are people, sometimes they are not. And so I highly recommend having ways of interpreting the court cards as things other than people, concepts, ideas, things other than people, but also having a way for uh, identifying them as people. And if you would like to uh, learn more about that, I do have a PDF in my Etsy shop called Who's Who in the Court Cards, and it goes through various ways that you can identify people in your readings using the court cards. But I truly do believe that the better grasp you have on the court cards, the, I shouldn't say the better quality reading you will give, because I know people that still struggle with the court cards that can still give really great readings. But for you in your personal practice, the better grasp you have on the court cards, the farther you will excel in your own reading. So even if you are a really good reader now, the better relationship you have with the court cards, it can actually help you to really step up as a reader. Now, this next tip is a pretty advanced one. This is really, for the most part, by and large, for people who have already been reading for a while. Um, I do know some people that they will pick one of these things and really run with it from the beginning as they learn tarot because they have a, an interest in that particular study. But by and large, a lot of us learn the traditional meanings first, and then we can add in these other things that I'm about to talk about uh, in order to really enhance or take our readings up to the next level. And what I'm talking about here is expanding your interpretations of the cards by including different studies like astrology, numerology, elemental dignities, health meanings. Now, I got to give a big disclaimer there. Um, I know there are people that give health readings, but by and large, it is considered illegal because you have to be very, very careful if you're doing anything related to health professionally, because here in the United States, there is a law that prevents people from practicing medicine without a license. And if you're doing anything that can be considered diagnosing anyone or recommending treatment or treating anyone it actually violates that law. It can be a very serious crime. I know that there are people who do health readings regardless of that, um, but I never advise doing health readings, especially paid health readings, because it does open you up to some liability here in the United States. But I did take the time to work with health meetings for the major arcana because I use that in my past life readings. Uh, because I can't be tried for practicing medicine without a license regarding a past life. So I do use that information in my past life readings. Um, but regardless of how you intend to use the information, because I am not responsible for what you do with the information, uh, health meanings could be something you choose to study. Uh, location correspondences to the cards. I do have... Um, I only do the majors, but I know some people do the majors and the minors that I have a lo lo like various locations associated with those. I use those in a couple of different kinds of readings. I also have career correspondences. Again, for myself, I do this with the majors only. This is also something that I use in past life readings. Another um, 
added layer of meaning could involve timing in the tarot. There are certain readers who don't mess with timing at all. Um, there are certain readers that, uh, like myself, I generally only read, like if I'm doing anything that's predictive, I only look at the next 90 day window. But I also have some other ways of doing timing in the tarot as well, depending on what I'm doing in the reading. But anything along those lines, they there can be specific areas of study or ideas, concepts uh, associated with the cards that you're really interested in. And so you study those and add those as another layer to your meanings. All right, so this next one may surprise some of you guys. I have talked before about my struggle with pick a card readings. I did try to do a second channel that was just pick a card readings, but I got to tell you, I struggle too much with the concept of giving pick a card readings. It, it's, mm, it's a hard one for me and I wasn't happy with how the channel was looking, what was on it. I just wasn't happy with it. And so I deleted a few videos and then I just unlisted everything else for now. I don't know where I'm going to go with that channel in the future, if I'm going to do anything with that channel in the future, because I just, I'm not meant, I don't think, to do pick a card readings on YouTube. I just, all right, tough subject for me. Anyhow, maybe I'll do a video all about my thoughts on pick a card readings at some point in time so that I can really explain where I'm coming from and my thoughts on it. But regardless of how I, regardless of how I feel about doing pick a card readings, I do enjoy watching them, but maybe not for the reason a lot of you think. I like to watch pick a card readings, not so much because I watch a lot of uh, pick a card readings that have nothing to do with uh, me and what else is going on in my life, topics that I don't need that question answered. But I watch them anyhow because I love to watch how other readers work with the deck. I love to watch how other readers interpret the cards and I don't have to adopt what they're doing. Uh, though sometimes I do get inspired or I do adopt a certain style of practice or a meaning for a card that I had never thought of before, but just, I hear it and it really, really resonates with me. I love seeing the perspective that other readers come at the tarot with, because even if it's not something I will ever use, it gets me thinking about the tarot. It gets me thinking about how I use tarot, how I connect with tarot. And all of that, I believe, helps me to develop into a better reader. So even if the pick a cards aren't about anything that pertains to you, if you find some pick a card readers on YouTube with styles that you like or you find interesting, then I recommend following them, watching what they do, and just being inspired by them or allow them to get you thinking about how you interpret the cards and how you work with tarot as a way to sort of challenge you. So like I said, while I'm not the hugest fan of pick a card readings because I have my own personal internal struggle with them as a reader, I do watch them and I do recommend others watch them to see, you know, just how it can help you grow and learn and evolve as a reader. The next tip is that I encourage people and students who are learning tarot for me. And if you don't know, I do offer one-on-one -on -one tarot mentorships through my website, which will be linked in the description box below. But I always recommend that you try new things. Once you've got a deck that you connect with, once you've got some go-to spreads, once you think that you understand how you view and work with tarot, try some new things, shake things up. Will everything be a winner? Will you embrace and adopt everything into your practice? No, but trying new and different things, whether they become things that you will use forever and a day, you're still going to learn and grow as a reader just from trying and experimenting with new things. Next up is I recommend that you challenge yourself by asking questions that are outside of your norm or maybe a little outside of your comfort zone even. 
So if you normally only do a certain type of reading, challenge yourself by trying a completely new type of reading. So maybe you find that you do a lot of love readings, but not much else when it comes to tarot. That just seems to be the way it has worked out. Maybe try past life readings or maybe try career readings, but try doing different types of readings, asking different types of questions that give you a little push, that give you a challenge as a reader to look at the cards in a different context and a different light. The next tip is that you always want to strive to make your readings make sense. And by this, I mean that we are always striving to weave a coherent story from the cards that are in our spread. So when you are doing a spread, or even if you do a method more so than a spread, you want to weave it all together. You want to turn it all into one coherent story. You don't want your reading to be disjointed. You want to tie it all together. So I know this might sound odd, but if you have difficulty in doing that, maybe look into doing some creative writing. You can find books that will help you with creative writing. You can find classes, you can find YouTube videos, you can find online journal prompts, you can find books that are dedicated to all kinds of different prompts and exercises for working on your creative writing skills. But working on creative writing, or even you could do uh, nonfiction writing too, if you are learning to uh, string things all together into one coherent narrative, I really recommend the creative writing more than the nonfiction writing, because you are wholly and solely weaving together a consistent narrative when you're doing creative writing. So if you have a lot of trouble making your readings one coherent story and not being disjointed, then I highly recommend working on your creative writing skills. Do you have to be an award-winning creative writer in order to read tarot? Absolutely not. You do not have to be Stephen King or Anne Rice or whoever your favorite fiction author is. But I do think that working on that skill a little bit, even if you're not going to go into creative writing or use that in other areas of your life, if you're really struggling to turn your readings into one coherent story, that working on some creative writing could really help you to be able to smooth your readings into one consistent narrative. And this tip kind of leads into my next tip, which is journaling. Now, I know a lot of people groan and roll their eyes and they hate journaling, but I cannot emphasize enough how important journaling is when you are working with tarot. I already showed you guys uh, when I did the beginner's tarot spread, my tarot spread journal that I have that I keep all of my favorite spreads in partially because I just don't want to ever lose them because as I've explained before, you know, things go through phases. Sometimes you'll do a reading a lot for an extended period of time. And then for whatever reason, you're not doing that reading again for maybe a year or more, but it'll come back around. It'll be something you want to revisit. So if nothing else, a journal where you keep track of your tarot spreads. It's also a great idea, you know, if you're doing the creative writing thing to have a journal for practicing your creative writing. It's a good idea to journal your, when you do a reading, especially in the beginning, it's a great idea to journal the results of the reading. It's also great to journal about different methods for using the tarot, different meanings for the cards, different correspondences. You know, I talked about adding in other elements into your tarot reading, like astrology, numerology. Those are all great things to keep in a journal as you learn all of that stuff and how it interacts with tarot or can be layered in with tarot. It's a great idea to keep a journal of all that information. And if you followed me for a minute, you know that I have created my own line of journals. I do actually have one of the journals that I created. I love it. It honest to goodness 
is one of my all time favorite journals. I really do love the quality of these journals. I do love the way that they are done. They are amazing. They were in my main Etsy shop spirit tarot, but because of how Etsy is, I have moved them on over to their own separate shop, which is Raven Witch journals. And I will link that in the description box below. Cause if you need a journal, they are amazing journals and I even have one available right now that is just for the design on the cover, uh, it says tarot spreads and it has this really lovely, like moon esque tarot card on it. Um, so, you know, I do have some that kind of are designed for specific purposes in mind, but I have a lot that can be used for whatever your purposes are. Another thing that you could journal about is my next tip, which is develop your intuition or psychic abilities. We all have intuition. I believe we all have psychic abilities to some extent. And while you can read tarot just solely based on the memorized meanings, I don't want to invalidate anybody who reads like that because there are readers out there that that is how they read and they are amazing readers. But as a general rule, developing your intuition and your psychic abilities can enhance your tarot readings and help you to give more accurate tarot readings and higher quality tarot readings. Now, this is a big topic. We're not going to talk about developing your intuition in this video, but I do have a couple of videos here on the channel that go over some intuition development exercises and techniques that you can try. And I'll try to remember to link those in the description box down below. The next tip that I have is that before you do readings, make sure you are in the right mental and emotional state to be doing readings. If you are experiencing any extreme of emotion, any a really super intense emotion that may not be the right time for you to do a reading. A lot of us, but not all of us, uh, ground and center before a reading or have some other little ritual that we do to get us in the right mental emotional state in order to do a reading. I know that, you know, if you are a professional reader, this can be difficult because sometimes whether you're really in the right mental emotional state or not, you may be in a situation where you just have to figure out a way to, um, deal with what you've got going on internally and just get the reading done. Because if something happens and you're at say a fair or an event where you are expected to read and you can't really bow out, you've got to figure out a way to get yourself into the right mental emotional state. And again, a lot of people do grounding and centering, but there are other things that you can do. Find what works best for you. You know, in a lot of cases, what I would say is if you're not in the right mental emotional state, put off the reading. But I understand as a professional reader that sometimes we don't have that luxury. And so make sure you have ways to get yourself in the right mental and emotional state to be doing a clear and empowering and accurate reading. So figure out a way to handle those emotions, have good emotional IQ to know whether or not you are in the right mental emotional state to be doing a reading at that time. So another tip that I have, and I find this very, very important. Um, this is one of like some of my other tips. If you want to ignore them, that's fine. And honestly, you can ignore this one too, because we each have our own style of reading, but I highly recommend for giving quality, accurate readings that you do a wrap up of your reading at the end that summarizes the most important points that came out in the reading. Now, why do I say this? Well, according to the Tarot Association, and they are not the be all end all in my book, but they've, they've done a little looking into this. And according to them, Querents will only remember five to nine pieces of information from a full length reading. Now, in my personal experience, five would be amazing. Most querents do not retain five to nine in my personal experience. They retain four, maybe, uh, depending on the reading and depending on the querent. Now, have I had querents that can retain five to nine pieces of information from a reading? Yes. 
but that is not what I find to be the norm, if you will. It's actually less than what the Tarot Association quotes in my personal experience. And I haven't like kept track of the data, but just from working with people, talking to people, I really find that it's less than five pieces of information or, or less than five points that they will retain. And they also don't define what a full length reading is. For me, a full length reading is a half an hour to an hour, honestly. I used to only consider hour long readings, full length readings, but because of Etsy, I now consider a half an hour to be a full length reading because I find, and I don't know whether it's the economy, I don't know if it's people's attention spans, but I find half an hour readings are far more preferable to clients than hour long readings. I do have clients that like hour long readings and will get hour long readings. But when given the option, I find most clients opt for a half an hour reading. And even at the half an hour, I do not find people retaining five to nine pieces of information. But this is part of why it's so important to summarize because as the reader, I am retaining that information as I'm doing the reading. I am looking at the cards. And so I make sure to wrap up my readings with the high points, the messages that I feel spirit really wants to make sure the client walks away with. And so I always give a wrap up or a summary at the end of the reading. My next two tips actually go together. The first one is don't be afraid to be different. You do not have to read like everyone else out there. Sometimes being different is actually the best thing. So don't be afraid to do things different. Don't be afraid to experiment with things. Don't be afraid if you aren't doing it like the other readers you know. And that sort of blends into my next tip, which is have fun. I mean, you should always be respectful to tarot as a tool. A lot of us consider it a spiritual tool, but it also doesn't have to be. It can be just a fortune telling method. It can. Uh, I know that fortune telling is a dirty word anymore, but it doesn't have to be. And if that's how you want to read, that's how you read. And that's perfectly okay. But again, have fun but be respectful. It's okay to be a little silly from time to time and ask questions that are kind of off the wall. This goes back to the whole idea I talked about earlier of challenging yourself to look at the cards in new and different ways. For example, I saw a TikTok with a reader who she asks about cryptids. Like it's, it's a little segment thing that she does. And so she had a TikTok where a viewer had asked the question, is Bigfoot real? And if Bigfoot is real, can humans meet with Bigfoot? Now, a lot of people would consider this a completely outlandish series of questions. There are people that would be like, that's a waste of time. That's disrespectful to tarot. I don't think it is. I think that if we are using this as a learning tool, if we are using this to challenge ourselves and to learn and grow as a reader and to challenge ourselves to look at the cards in new and different ways, that asking off the wall shit like this can have its time and place as long as we're being respectful in the grand scheme of things. And in case anyone's what, wondering how that reading came out, uh, yes, Bigfoot is real. No, we cannot mate with Bigfoot. It, it's actually a different species according to her reading. So in case anybody was wondering, that was the results of the reading. And I know there are other readers out there that would be like, oh my God, no, that would just absolutely throw a fit if they saw someone asking questions of that to the tarot. But I think that as long as you're being respectful and you're using it as an opportunity to push yourself, to challenge yourself, to look at the cards in new and different ways, that it's perfectly okay. And we don't have to be serious all the time. We do not need to have a stick up our ass in order to read tarot. We can have fun with it. We can be silly. Another thing that can help you to deliver quality readings is to incorporate other tools into your tarot readings. Now you do not have to do this, uh, but it's something that does help some people 
level up their readings, if you will. And some of the things that you could include would be, you know, just making sure that you have a cup of tea that maybe the herbs in your tea are beneficial to uh, whatever psychic gifts you have or intuition or things like that. You could use crystals, incense, candles, pendulums, runes, dice, whatever interests you. And again, you don't have to use any of this. You don't have to incorporate other tools into your tarot readings to be a good tarot reader. It's just that some people do find that incorporating other things into their tarot does help them to level up their tarot reading. So don't be afraid to experiment with these things and see if any of them help you to get to the next level of reading. All right, these last two tips are some really, really big ones. The first one is don't let the fear of getting it wrong hold you back. You know, when I was a younger tarot reader, and even to this day, I still struggle for this, with this, I guess would be the correct wording. But, you know, I really want to give the clients that come to me the best readings possible. And sometimes, especially early on, I found myself holding back because I was afraid to be wrong. I would pick up on something and I'd be like, no, that can't be. That's outlandish. That sounds crazy. No, I don't want to say that because if I get it wrong, I'll look like a fool. And I, especially as a young tarot reader, allowed that fear to hold me back as a reader. When I started letting go of that fear and trusting myself to just uh, basically word vomit what comes into my brain as I'm doing a reading, I found my readings were actually better because that fear of getting it wrong was no longer holding me back. Remember, I've said this already, but we are all human beings. So at the end of the day, none of us is 100% accurate. We are all going to get it wrong from time to time. It means we're human. It's okay. It's how you handle getting it wrong that really matters, right? We learn from it. We handle it with grace and we move on from there. So don't let the fear of getting it wrong hold you back because I guarantee you if you're holding back because you're afraid of getting it wrong, you are not achieving the level of readings that you are capable of. And lastly, this ties into that, give yourself grace and patience. Again, at the end of the day, we are all human beings. It is called a tarot practice. Okay. None of us know it all. We are always learning and growing lifelong. It doesn't matter whether we have read tarot for five years or 50. There is always something for us to continue learning. There's always room for us to continue growing as readers. So give yourself grace and patience. Allow yourself to make mistakes. Allow yourself to experiment with different things. Allow yourself to experience different things. And it is okay to change your mind about things that you previously believed about tarot. It's okay to be like, oh, I started out working with tarot in this way and now I view tarot this way. It's okay to learn and grow and change and expand and it's okay to make mistakes too. Okay, so this wound up being way longer than I wanted it to be, but I hope that you have found some helpful tips in this video for, you know, becoming the best tarot reader you can be, for delivering the most accurate and quality readings that you can deliver. Let me know which tips were your favorite or which were the most helpful to you. Let me know if you have any tips that maybe I didn't include here that you think are important for delivering the most accurate and quality readings to your clients. I love to hear from you all. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel because that helps out so much. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up so that I know that you like this kind of content and it helps out the channel so, so much. But until I see you all again, blessings to you wherever your journey finds you.